Okay. okay guys, we are going to get started for today. If you will remember last time we were talking about dividends. We talked about the declaration date and the record date. Okay, so, um, and we said, okay, if there's a sale of shares between the declaration date and the record date, the purchaser pays the taxes. And if there's a gift between the declaration date and the record date, the donor pays the taxes. So different tax rules depending upon what kind of transaction you have. Okay? One date we did not talk about, which we're going to talk about today, is the ex-dividend date. So the ex-dividend date is in between the declaration date and the record date. The ex-dividend date is basically the day that the corporation goes and gets all their documents and determines who they think their shareholders are. And then the record date is, of course, the date on record when these shareholders, you know, they determine these are the ones who get it, etc. So the ex-dividend date is very similar to the record date. Usually they are, you know, within a day or two of each other, okay? Okay, so, and we'll talk about why we care in just a second. So, dividends are subject to two different kinds of rates, okay? You will remember when we talked about um, long-term capital gains, we said that long-term capital gains have preferential rates, so do qualified dividends. So if you have a qualified dividend, okay, you are taxed at either 0%, 15%, or 20 Okay? This works exactly the same as long-term capital gains. If the taxpayer is for ordinary income, is in the highest tax bracket at 39.6%, they pay taxes on qualified dividends at 20%. Okay? If the taxpayer is in a tax bracket 15% or below, okay, for their ordinary income, then they are going to pay tax at 0% for qualified dividends. They are anywhere in between, they fall in the 15% category. This works identically to long-term capital gains. If the dividend is not qualified, it is taxed at the regular progressive rates. So if the taxpayer is in the 39.6% tax bracket, these dividends are going to be taxed at 39.6%, okay? And so forth and so on. So how do you know if a dividend is qualified? If you look here on slide 30, the following dividends are not qualified. Dividends from certain foreign corporations. There are some exceptions to this. Um, I'll show you in, a, in the next slide. Okay. Dividends from tax exempt entities and dividends that do not satisfy the holding period requirement. So this holding period requirement is what I want to talk about right now. The holding period requirement is based on this X dividend date. With the holding period, in order to qualify as a qualified dividend, the shareholder must hold the stock for more than 60 days, okay, during 
the 121 day period beginning 60 days before the ex-dividend date. It's a little bit funky. But the purpose of this rule, okay, is to basically keep people from buying stock after a declaration, receiving a dividend, and then receiving lower rates on it. It's like being a fan of a sports team only when they're winning, okay? Um, so Congress wants to keep this from happening, so they say you have to have held the stock for a certain period of time in order to get these lower rates. You're not going to have to actually calculate this, count days, etc. Okay? Just want you to know the rule and know what happens if a taxpayer or a shareholder doesn't qualify. So if you look at the example in the book on page 23, okay? In this example, we have two shareholders, Daniel and Madison. I believe it says Daniel satisfies the holding period, but Madison does not. Okay? So both of them receive a $1,500 dividend. But Daniel's dividend is going to be subject to tax either at 0, 15, or 20 percent, depending upon which tax bracket he's in. Okay? Let's assume Daniel is in the top bracket of 39.6 percent then Daniel is going to be taxed at 20%. Okay? Which equals $300. We'll also assume that Madison is in the top bracket at 39.6%. Okay? So her, her tax for her dividend is going to be... What's the number? Yeah, I mean, oh. can you multiply these two numbers? Oh, we're talking about now. Okay. It's going to be close to $600. Okay. Five, $600. Approximately. Okay. Real close. Yeah, approximately, <laughs> you're right. Approximately double that of Daniel for the same. Like I said, there are some exceptions. If you receive a dividend from a foreign court, it can be qualified if the foreign court is registered on the U.S. securities market or if the foreign corporation is eligible for benefits under a tax rate. Okay? Which a lot of companies are eligible for benefits under a tax treaty. And that was on slide 31. Okay. So the next topic in this chapter, there are two topics we're going to talk about. Income received by an agent and then income received by a partnership or an S-Corp or a trust. Okay, so income received by agent, I'll mention this very briefly. For those of you that have taken business law, maybe you're taking it right now, maybe you'll take it in the future, okay? Agency law is one of the topics that is covered in every business law class, okay? Agency law is all about what bad things can the agent do that the principal is still responsible for, okay? So if you're an employee, you are an agent for your employer, simple example, okay? Your real estate agent is just that, an agent for you to, you know, help you go and buy a house, you hire um, a lawyer to help you, they would be an agent for you to negotiate a contract, that kind of thing. They can speak on your behalf. Um, 
Sometimes they can sign for you. It just depends upon the responsibilities of that agent. Okay? This just stands for the simple principle that when an agent receives money on behalf of its principal, it is the principal that has to pay taxes on it, not the agent. Makes sense? If you work at your job at Subway and you receive cash for sandwiches, you don't pay taxes on that cash, your employer does. Okay, you are the agent. Okay. The next topic we are going to talk about is income from partnerships and as corps and trusts and estates. But we are first going to talk about partnerships. Now, this is not a class on business entity taxation. I get that, okay? But individuals are often partners in a partnership or beneficiaries of a trust or shareholders of a corporation. So they do have income from these entities. So what we want to look at is how that income is reported to the individuals, okay? Which is the question we're going to talk about right now. And it is difficult to do that without a little bit of a discussion of taxation of these entities. Okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is partnerships. Okay? So partnerships, the partnership itself, files a form 1065, which is a purely informational return. That means that no tax is due from this return. But it still has to be filed. This reports the income, the losses, all the activities of the partnership. But no tax is actually due from this return. Where is the tax paid? Well, partnerships are passed through entities. I'm sure you've all heard that. So income and loss from the partnership is passed up through to its underlying partners, okay? Partners receive a K-1, and this K-1 has their allocation of income. So for example, let's say we have partner A and partner B. They are both 50% partners in a partnership, okay? And the partnership in this particular year generates $100 of operating profits, okay? So that means that partner A will be allocated $50 of the profits and partner B will be allocated $50. Partner A will receive a schedule K-1 with $50 on it and so forth for partner B. The form 1065 will say income or profits $100. Okay? So there are basically two things two, um, I should say, transactions that occur at the partnership level. And I want to talk about both. The first one, income allocations. We just talked about that. This is when the partners receive their piece of the income. Okay? Their allocation. The second component is a distribution. Or it can also be called a draw. Distributions are largely tax-free. So when we say a partnership has one level of tax, we are talking about right here. When we say a C corporation has two levels of tax, we are talking about the income, when it is earned by the C Corp, is taxed. And when the shareholder receives a dividend later, it is potentially taxed. Okay? 
That's what that means. So the distribution piece is largely tax-free. Now, one thing I want everyone to understand here, this is important. The, the income allocation carries with it no cash, okay? The income allocation, although it's, it's funny because it's called an income allocation, all it really is is an allocation of tax liability. There is no money that comes with this. The money comes here, okay? So it is very possible you could have a partner that receives an income allocation but no distribution. So what does that mean? It means they had to pay a tax bill from their business but had no cash from their business. Okay? It is very possible. Which is why it is important if you have clients that come in, make sure and read their partnership agreement. See what it says about distributions. A lot of partnership agreements, if you have good people drafting them, will say that the partner, at a minimum, receives a distribution to cover their tax liability. Just so you don't have people on the hook for their income allocation with no distribution or cash to help them cover it. So a distribution and a draw are essentially the same thing the difference is timing. A draw comes before the allocation. Draws are very common with law firms, accounting firms. Why? Because the partners can't make it all year without income. Okay? So once a month, they'll take a draw. Okay? That basically means they're taking an advance distribution. Okay, and we'll see an example right now. We'll look at it. Did you still have a question? No. Okay. Did you still have a question? Okay. So if we look at an example, <coughs> this is example 27. In this example, we have Tara, who owns a one-half interest in a partnership. Okay. Um, for 2016, the partnership earned revenue of $150,000 and had operating expenses of $80,000. Okay, and this is on page 417. Okay, so that basically leaves a $70,000 operating profit here. Okay, so since Tara, uh, oh, it also says that Tara takes a monthly draw of $2,500, okay? So she has a monthly draw of $2,500, which is $30,000 for that year. So what we want to know is what is Tara's income allocation? $35,000, right? Because Tara owns a half interest. She's going to receive half of the uh, profits, so $35,000. It doesn't matter that she only received a draw of $30,000. Okay? So that is a very simple example of partnership tax. So um, if you guys are in the accounting program, which I know most of you are, and you're going to do the five-year program and you think you might want to do tax, we're going to start offering a class in just partnership tax starting not this coming year, year after. So if that's something you're interested in, we are going to start offering it. I know because I'm teaching it. So, um, FYI. Okay. So, the next topic, the next type of entity is called an S corporation. An S corporation is also a pass through entity. 
okay? It is a type of corporation that qualifies and elects to be treated as an S corp, okay? When we were talking about dividends yesterday, we were largely talking about treatment for C corps. So C corps are really the type of corporation that you think about, okay? These are your large publicly traded corporations, okay? Um, and they are the ones that have the two levels of tax. Okay? But S Corps are also a type of corporation, but they are passed through and are largely treated the same as partnerships. So the shareholders in an S Corp will receive a K1 with their income allocation and will potentially receive a distribution or a dividend, which is largely tax free. Yes. I think this is about partnerships, but like like a big accounting firms that have like hundreds of partners, like is it still like work the same way, like withdrawals and stuff? Yes, it is. Okay. So you're not on salary at that point or partners in a partnership technically like cannot be on payroll. They do not receive a W-2. So then at like KPMG, like how do they pay their partners? Um, there's two different ways they could do it. One, they could do a draw, which is common. There's another way they could do it. It's called a guaranteed payment, which is very similar to a salary. It's like we tell you you're going to get this amount every year. And that amount that you receive is not part of your income allocation. It is very similar to a salary, except you don't receive a W-2 for it, okay? It's against the rules. Although I've seen a lot of accounting firms, smaller accounting firms, that do issue W-2s for partners in a partnership, and that is actually wrong. They're not supposed to receive W-2s because they are not employees. A partner in a partnership cannot be an employee, okay? Um, <clears throat> but that's, there's one of two ways. They can either do a draw or they can have a guarantee. All right. So, um, let's see, what else? Okay, so we were talking about S Corps and we were talking about C Corps. So, one thing I do, this isn't really in the book, but I want to make sure everyone understands this. This whole concept of an S Corporation or a C Corporation is purely a concept of tax law, okay? You cannot, and I'm sure you've learned about this in your business law class, when an entity is created under state law, maybe it's an LLC, maybe it's a limited partnership, maybe it's a corporation, maybe it's an LLP, when you create an entity under state law, you go to the Secretary of State's website and you make the entity. That is not the same as how it is treated for tax purposes, okay? For tax purposes, you can have an entity that is a, um, it can either be four things, an S Corp, a C Corp, a partnership, or the last option, is a disregarded entity. A disregarded entity is just that. It means the IRS ignores it. They treat like treat it like it doesn't exist, and all income and losses from this entity pass right up to whoever owns it. So in this class, we have talked a very little about Schedule C. And we will have a whole chapter where we talk about Schedule C. Schedule C is where income and loss is reported for a sole proprietor only. Okay? That is a disregarded entity. Okay? So you would see Schedule C would flow up because it is a disregarded entity. To be a disregarded entity, there can only be one owner. One plus spouse, basically. All right? So someone asked me in the last class, 
Could a partnership ever be a disregarded duty? No. Because a disregarded entity has one owner, and a partnership has how many? Two, at least two. What if they're married? Then they, it, well, that is still considered to be one. It can be other one or two, whichever you want, want to be, basically. If you're married, the, uh, that's an exception under the tax law, and they will count that as one owner. Okay? Um, so, someone asked me in the last class, if you have an LLC under state law, how is it taxed? Well, actually, I have clients tell me this quite often. I'll say, how are you taxed? And they'll say, I'm an LLC. Well, that tells me nothing. Because an LLC can be taxed as either a partnership, an S-corp, a C-corp, or disregarded it. Okay? It just depends upon how many owners the S-corp has and what they choose to do. Under our current tax system, entities can choose under some certain circumstances, it's called a check the box selection, which entity they want to be taxed as for tax purposes. Okay? So I just want you to understand, sometimes there's a lot of confusion on that front, the difference between creating an entity under state law and having an entity for tax purposes. They are different. Okay? So, um, the next thing that this chapter discusses is income from a estate or a trust. So if you have a beneficiary of an, of an estate or of a trust, they only pay taxes on earned income that is distributed. So it must be both earned and distributed. So for example, we were talking about Elvis maybe a couple weeks back and how Elvis's estate for some reason receives all of, they basically received the intellectual property rights to the Elvis brand and Elvis music, okay? So all royalties are paid to Elvis's estate. So now, 30 years later, Elvis's estate, 40 years after he died, Elvis's estate is paying, files an annual income tax return to pay taxes on those royalties. So these royalties are considered, you know, earned income, okay? And it, when these royalties are distributed out, then the individual beneficiary is going to have to pay taxes. Okay? So, that's kind of how it works. I'm not an expert on this area. I don't honestly know a lot about it. So, that I do know. Okay. So, the next topic I want to talk about is income from community property states. So, do you guys know what a community property is versus separate property? Y'all ever heard that before? Maybe some of you have? Okay. So a community in a community property state, this is a concept of property ownership. In a community property state, when two spouses are married and they generate income, it is put into a community bucket. And it is owned 50% by one spouse and 50% by the other. So if you have one spouse, who is a waitress and earns $20,000 a year, and you have another who's an accountant and owns 150. Jointly, they own 170. 
and one of them is treated as having um, 85, yeah, that's right, 85. One of them is treated as having 85 of income, and the other is treated as having 85 of income. It's put into a community bucket. It doesn't actually matter who earned it from what job in a community property state. So then when you get divorced, you split everything? Yes, theoretically. There's negotiation, but theoretically. So, even in a community property state, you can have separate property. Separate property really comes into the picture in two ways. One, it was yours when you brought it into the marriage. You owned a house before you got married, so you bring it into the marriage, it is your separate property. It does not get put in the community bucket. And the second way that something can be separate property large way is if income is either inherited or gifted so if during marriage your grandfather dies and leaves you fifty thousand dollars that is your separate money it does not get put in the community bucket if you're during your grandfather's life he gifted you fifty thousand dollars same thing it is your separate property there's some other ways but those are the biggest so, which states are community property states? I'm going to write it on the board. Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Wisconsin. I don't know what the abbreviation is for Wisconsin. W-I. W-I. There are too many W states to keep up with. Okay. So these are the community property states. As you can see, this is not the majority of states, but Louisiana is there. That's right next door. Texas is there. Obviously, we care about that. And California is there, which, as we know, is a huge state with a huge population. So it is very important that we understand community property ownership and why we care about it. Obviously, it matters in divorce. Okay? And it also matters for tax purposes as well. Federal law will look to state law to determine community property. So let me give you an example. I had a client, and she was really not happy with um, her husband. He owned his own business, and she did not like, she said, he's not taking care of his tax responsibilities. I don't want to be responsible for this. So she said, I want to file separately. And I said, okay, you can file separately. But if you do that, we are in a community property state. So all we're going to do is take your income and his income from your jobs, add them up, produce one big number, and give half to you and half to him. We can't, unfortunately, that's what we can't really say the income from his business is going to stay with him and the income from your job is going to stay with you. It doesn't work that way. We have to split it and say half of his income is yours and half of your income is his and vice versa. So all we could really do was divide our tax liability in half. Say, okay, this way at least you're only responsible for half of his taxes. Okay. But if you were in a separate property state, that would work. Okay? You could say his income from his job goes to him, her income from her job goes to her, file separately. Because we're in Texas, that doesn't work. Okay? So, um, now, there's one other thing I want to talk about. There are three states, Louisiana, Texas, and Idaho, that go even farther. In these states, they say that income 
from separate property is community property. So if you had a um, mineral interest that you brought into the marriage, it is your separate property. But then oil is found and they start drilling and you get royalties. If you are in Louisiana, Texas, or Idaho, those royalties, although they are from a separate property, are community property. If you're in California, for example, those royalties remain separate property. If we were in some other state, I probably wouldn't even mention this. Since we are in Texas and we are next door to Louisiana, it is important that we know that. Yes. So if you, like, got a divorce, he, he or she can take the consent <coughs> of your pre-existing mineral rights, theoretically? No, not the rights. The rights themselves are separate property and they would be exclusively yours. But any sort of royalties... So like royalties forever? What 50% would go to your... Not court? forever, just for the time that you're married. Because during the time that you're married is when you have community property. So when you Once get you divorced, get divorced <coughs> the separate property is still yours? Yes, the separate property still goes with you. Of course, everything is up for negotiation, right? But, yes, the separate property would go with you. And while you're married, any income from that property is community property. Okay? So interest, royalties, rent, okay? All things that could produce income. So... If you look, we'll talk about example 28. And in this example, we have Bob and Jane, and they live in California. Okay? During the year, there was a dividend received by Jane. This is on page 418. A dividend received by Jane from stock gifted by her mom. It was gifted after marriage, but it doesn't matter. It was still gifted. Okay? Um, we have... Bob has a $10,000 gain from the sale of property bought before marriage. And lastly, Jane has royalties from a lease bought with separate funds. So, this means probably what it means is she was gifted some money or inherited some money or she brought some money in from marriage and took that and bought this so it remains separate because she used separate funds to buy it. So with Jane's stock that was gifted, is that separate property? Yes. Yes. The dividend that comes from it, she's in California. Will that be separate or community? Separate. Separate. If she was in Texas, it would be community, right? Okay. Bob has a $10,000 gain from property bought before marriage. Is this going to be uh, separate? Yes. Yes. Because he brought the property in for marriage. This is going to be just Bob's. Okay? Jane has royalties from a lease bought by separate funds. So we know that the lease is separate. Are the royalties also going to stay separate? Yes. If she was in Texas, the answer would be no. Okay? Yes. What if there was like a prenup? 
anything? It's not going to change anything for tax purposes. Okay, the IRS doesn't give a crap what kind of agreement you have, mm -hmm. for the most part. Okay, there are some agreements that they will honor. That's really not one of them. But we're no one's really getting divorced here. You know what I mean? We're yeah. they're married. So, but the IRS doesn't care. Okay. okay? Um, now that may change. You know that may affect a division in a divorce, which is the whole point of a prenup. But the point of a prenup is not to get around taxes. Yeah. Okay. And if it is, it's probably void. So, um, so, and I'm not a property lawyer, so I don't really know all the answers about like that, or very many of them, honestly. Okay. So there's that. Problem. And the next problem, right down the page on example 29, okay, we have Fred and Wilma. Now, please note that the, the, the problem I just did, it only matters what is separate in community if they fall separately. If they fall jointly in California, it doesn't matter. It's all going to be pushed together jointly. It only matters if they're choosing to fall separately. Okay? So, um, and honestly, a lot of taxpayers that, you know, are in the higher income brackets, they'll choose to fall separately. Okay? Because of all the marriage penalties out there. It just depends upon the situation. So, um, let's see. We have Fred and Wilma, and they file separate returns, okay? Fred has a salary from his job of $25,000, okay? And he has $300 of interest on a savings account that he established in his name, okay? So he has $300 of interest from a savings account. Does it matter that he opened this savings account in his own name? Does that make it separate property? No. No, not relevant at all. Okay? It matters if the funds that he got to put in the savings account came from separate property. Okay? But the fact that it is only in his name is not, doesn't matter at all. Okay? So, that is free. Does it matter if he opens the account before they're married or after they're married? Yes, okay. it would matter. If he opened the account before they're married, then any of the money that's in that account would be his separate, separate money. Yes. But what if he's contributing to it while they're married? The contributions while they're married are community. But everything that was in it before is his. It's separate, yes. It says all deposits to the savings account were made from Fed Fred's salary that he earned since the marriage. That's what it says in the facts. Okay. Wilma collected $2,000 taxable dividends on stock that she inherited. $2,000 in dividends. on inherited stock. So, I think that's it. So, if these taxpayers were in California, okay, with Fred's salary, this is community property, right? Okay? So, in California, half would go to Fred, and half would be attributed to Wilma. It doesn't matter that it's Fred's salary. If they were in Texas, same result. Okay? If they were in a separate property state, Fred would have income of $25,000 and Wilma would have none. Okay? Now, what about this interest of $300 from a savings account? So, this interest is community property, right? Okay. Um, 
and each of them would get half, 150, 150, in both California and in Texas, right? Separate uh, community property. Now, what about these dividends that Wilma got from inherited stock? So, what would be the result in California? The two thousand dollars would be. Um, that's right. It would all go to Wilma. Okay. What about in Texas? The community property, so it would be a thousand to Wilma and a thousand to Fred. And in a separate property state, Wilma would have all of it. Okay. So, okay. So that's how that works. Know that there is an exception for allocation of community income when spouses live apart for the entire year and then file separately. So we can turn off community property in that circumstance on the side. 36 says that at the bottom of the slide. Okay, good. Next topic, which is related, okay, is on alimony, child support, and payments made incident to divorce. So we are still on the family law topic, okay? Um, and honestly, Especially if you work at a smaller firm, these will be things you see a lot. If you work at a big firm, probably not, because your clients will mostly be businesses. But if you're working on a smaller at a smaller firm, this will be the kind of things that you see. Okay? So, and I'm actually, I'm just now starting to write a paper on tax issues in divorce. And it is going to be called, When the Code Meets the Big D. So it's going to be fun. So um, the first topic I want to talk about, okay, is alimony, okay? Now, most some of you may not really know what alimony is, but alimony is a payment to your ex-spouse so that they can basically live, okay? Alimony is not actually very common anymore. Um, it's more common in some states than others, but it's definitely not common in Texas. The reason is because courts tend to believe now that, and it's true, that women can are just as capable of working and supporting themselves as men. So there's really no reason to have alimony payments when both spouses are perfectly capable of going out and getting pretty much the same jobs. It used to be that alimony was a lot more common when women didn't have all the options that they have now. Nowadays, alimony is not all that common, okay? Um, so, alimony is really a payment to help the other spouse continue to live. Okay? Alimony is deductible by the payor and included in the income of the recipient. Child support is very common and it is just payments by one spouse to the other for the support of their children. Okay? Child support, unlike alimony, is not deducted and not included in income. No real tax consequences with child support. So, to qualify for alimony on slide 38, you can see some of these requirements that the code mandates. The payments have to be in cash, okay? Um, the, pay, the decree doesn't say that these payments specifically are not alimony. The payer and the payee can't be living in the same house at the time the payments are made. Which makes sense because the whole point of alimony is to pay for the support of someone else. If they're living with you, it's really not alimony. Maybe something else, but it's not alimony. Okay? So, and there can't be any liability to make payments after the death. So 
So this is on slide 38, the requirements for alimony. Um, the next category of payment incident to a divorce is a property settlement. So these, this happens when you're going through a divorce and you say, okay, I'll take the car, you take the truck. When you have this kind of thing going on, there are no tax consequences really. Because really you already owned it. Okay? You're just decide there's you're just deciding who's gonna take it with them after the divorce. There's not going to be any income to recognize here. The person who takes the property has a transferred basis. So if I had a $30,000 basis in my car and I take it with me in divorce, my basis will stay $30,000. Okay? So one thing that I do want to talk about in relation to child support and alimony, it can be difficult to tell if a payment is alimony versus child support. I think this is on the next slide, on slide 40, yes. So, the reason is because the divorce decree either doesn't say or what they call it isn't necessarily what it is for tax purposes. So, and there's an example in the book this is um, example 33 on page 421. In this example, it said, the divorce decree says that the ex-spouse will receive alimony payments of $500 per month. And after their child reaches age 21, these payments will decrease by will will go down to three hundred dollars a month. Since part of this payment is based upon the child's age, the child being alive, something like that, okay, then part of this payment will be recharacterized as child support because it is related to the child. Okay, dependent upon the child being alive, being under 21, etc. So $200 of this payment is child support. And $300 is alimony. Okay? Okay. So. The next topic that we will cover today, the last topic. We may not finish it, but we will start it. Is on imputed interest on the low market loans. Now, a lot of people, not just students, have trouble kind of justifying this in their mind. It's a little bit strange, okay? So this is a typical situation with imputed interest loans. You have a father, and he makes a $100,000 loan to his daughter. He doesn't charge any interest. Well, the code comes back in and says, okay, we get that you're not charging any interest, but we're going to pretend like you did. And we are going to allocate interest income to the lender. So the lender is who pays this, it's called imputed interest. So in my example, it would be the father. The father is going to pay tax on basically the difference between the AFR, okay, or the federal rate, okay, and the amount of interest he charged. If zero, it would be zero. So 
But I want you guys to understand. He's not actually charging interest. But the government is saying, we're going to pretend like you are and make you pay income taxes on that interest that you actually didn't receive. But we're going to pretend like you did receive it. We are going to impute it. We're going to say, you should have charged this interest rate, but you didn't. So we are going to make you pay taxes on this income that you actually didn't receive. So it's a funky thing, and a lot of people have trouble with this, okay? Because he's not actually receiving any income, okay? But the government says, we're going to pretend like you are, okay? So there's that tax consequence number one. Tax consequence number two. So he's not charging interest, right? He's saying 0% interest. So his daughter's not paying him interest. That means he also has a gift to his daughter. A gift of the imputed interest. Now remember, we still have, we talked about this a couple weeks back, I know, that $14,000 per donee annual exclusion. But if the interest, the annual interest, imputed interest, is above $14,000, and he's used up all of his unified credit, he could also be paying gift taxes on this loan. So he would be to pay income taxes for the imputed interest, and potentially paying gift taxes on the same amount, okay, for income that he never actually received, okay. So now this code section for below market loans applies to more than just gift loans, but that's really what we're talking about in this class for the most part. It also applies to compensation related loans, Corporate sh and corporate shareholder loans. So if you look at this slide 42, this shows the tax consequences to the lender and the borrower. With a gift loan, which is what I just illustrated over there, the lender has interest income and a gift is made. The borrower has an in potentially has an interest expense and a gift that's received. If it's a compensation related loan, so we have a loan from an employer to an employee, okay? The lender still has interest income, but also has a compensation expense because we treat that interest that they never received as compensation. And the borrower has compensation income for the amount of that interest that they did not have to pay. If it's a corporation to a shareholder, lender still has interest income, that stays the same. But since it's a loan to a shareholder, it's treated as a dividend that is paid. That, that's, if you understand, nothing is actually being paid, okay? But this is what we impute it, okay? So for tax purposes, it is paid, which means the borrower has dividend income, okay? So it's a funky thing because nothing actually, in real life, there's no money. But for tax purposes, there is. And this happens, unfortunately, it happens more often than we would like in the tax code. Where they create these pretend transactions and they say, we're going to impute this income here, even though really there's no income. This so, is one of these situations. So why would they make you pay taxes on income you didn't actually receive? Like, what's the point? What's the policy behind it? Uh, well, there's an example here in the book, actually. It's example 34, where they're basically explaining the policy, what they're trying to do. And it basically says we have the father who's in the 50% tax bracket, which currently we don't have a 50% tax bracket. But I think they're just using it for illustration purposes. 
and the daughter is in the 20% marginal bracket. Um, and the, do the father has 400000 that he doesn't need, and his daughter could use the money. So before this law change, which happened in 1984, he could transfer the cash to his daughter in exchange for a non-interest-bearing demand note. His daughter could invest the cash, and the income would be taxed at her 20% rate. Thus, the income that the father could have earned and that could have been taxed at 50% is now taxed at 20%. And the father is still retaining control over the principal because he can demand payment of the note at any time. So what they're trying to get around here is people trying to move income to lower tax brackets and a lender still has authority over the lending. Okay, so they could really demand payment at any time. That was the policy behind it. It's gone a lot farther than that, if you ask me, because um, now it's covering situations that maybe they didn't intend to cover, but that was at least the initial policy behind it. So if we're looking at that example of Kareem, okay, and he has he gives his daughter a four hundred thousand dollar loan. At the time of the loan, the AFR is 3.5% from January 1 to June 30th. You can look this rate up on the IRS's website, this AFR. It's published monthly. Um, and the imputed interest rules compound the interest semi-annually. Okay, I don't know that it says this anywhere in the book. No, it does say it. It says it on page 422 in the first sentence of that paragraph that it's compounded semi-annually. And from July 1st to December 31st, the rate goes up to 4%. Okay? So when we are calculating what is going to be Kareem's imputed interest, okay, we take $400,000, which is the principal, times the rate, 0 0.035 times one half, because that's for the first half of the year, which equals $7,000. Now, we have to do it for the second half of the year. $400,000 times 0 0.04, okay, um, to, sorry, forgot to add in, because it's compounded semi-annually, remember, we have to add in the $7,000 from the first half of the year, so it's going to be a base of $407,000 times 0.04% times one half of the year, which equals 8014. So Kareem, or the father, is going to have imputed interest this year of $15,140. Of course, next year, he will have more imputed interest, and the year after, and the year after, until the loan is paid off. So it can be a potential heavy tax burden for making a gift loan. Okay. Now... Um, there are some exceptions to these imputed interest rules, okay, there are three exceptions, and I think we will hold off on those exceptions until next time. What I would like to say is, for those of you that are volunteering with VITA, she really needs volunteers this Friday from 9 to 2. If you're available, I don't think she has any volunteers right now, so if you finished your training and you're eligible, please let me know, and you can go help her a good will.